Welcome to In Focus with Silvana Pavlovska, continuing our series in English on the Macedonian question. In particular, the scholarly publication, The Prespa Agreement as Cultural Genocide of the Macedonian National Identity Towards the Termination of an Illegal Treaty, a publication by eminent professor Dr. Igor Yanev, published late 2023. We've been going through the appendixes, and today we are going to be looking at Appendix 11. Appendix 11 on page 309 of this publication states the following. Legal aspects of problems of representation in the United Nations. UN document S1466. United Nations Security General Council s Slash 1466, 9th of March, 1950. The original is in the English language. Letter dated 8th of March, 1950, from the Secretary General to the President of the Security Council, transmitting a memorandum on the legal aspects of the problem of representation in the United Nations. 8th of March, 1950. During the month of February, 1950, I had a number of informal conversations with members of the Security Council in connection with the question of representation of states in the United Nations. In view of the proposal made by the representative of India for certain changes in the rules of procedure of the Security Council on this subject, I requested the preparation of a confidential memorandum on the legal aspects of the problem for my information. Some of the representatives on the Security Council to whom I mentioned this memorandum asked to see it, and I therefore gave copies to those representatives who were at the time present in New York. References to, to this referendum have now appeared in the press, and I feel it appropriate that the full text now be made available to all members of the Council. I'm therefore circulating copies of this letter and of the memorandum unofficially to all members and am also releasing the text of the memorandum to the press. Signed, Trigve Lei, Secretary General, February 1950. Legal Aspects of Problems of Representation in the United Nations is the title of the document. The primary difficulty in the current question of the representation of member states in the United Nations is that this question of representation has been linked up with the question of recognition by member governments. It will be shown here that this linkage is unfortunate from the practical standpoint and wrong from the standpoint of legal theory. From a practical standpoint, the present position is that representation depends entirely on a numerical count of the number of members in a particular organ which recognize one government or the other. It is quite possible for the majority of the members in one organ to recognize one government and for the majority of members in another organ to recognize the rival government. If the principle of individual recognition is adhered to, then the representatives of different governments could sit in different organs. Moreover, in organs like the Security Council of limited membership, the question of representation may be determined by the purely arbitrary fact of the particular governments which happen to have been elected to serve at a given time. From the standpoint of legal theory, the linkage of representation in an international organization and recognition of a government is a confusion of two institutions which have superficial similarities but are essentially different. The recognition of a new state or of a new government of an existing state is a unilateral act which the recognizing government can grant or withhold. 
It may be true that some legal writers have argued forcibly that when a new government, which comes into power through revolutionary means, enjoys with a reasonable prospect of permanency, the habitual obedience of the bulk of the population, other states are under a legal duty to recognize it. However, while states may regard it as desirable to follow certain legal principles in according or withholding recognition, the practice of states shows that the act of recognition is still regarded as essentially a political decision, which each state decides in accordance with its own free appreciation of the situation. A recent expression of this doctrine occurred during the consideration of the Palestine question in the Security Council, when the representative of Syria questioned the United States recognition of the provisional government of Israel. The representative of the United States, Mr. Austin, replied, we quote, I should regard it as highly improper for me to admit that any country on earth can question the sor so beg your pardon, sovereignty of the United States of America in the exercise of that high political act of recognition of the de facto status of a state, end of quote. I'll read this sentence or quotation again, quote, I should regard it as highly improper for me to admit that any country on earth can question the sovereignty of the United States of America in the exercise of that high political act of recognition of the de facto status of a state, end of quote. Quote, moreover, I would not admit here by implication or by direct answer that there exists a tribunal of justice or of any other kind anywhere that can pass judgment upon the legality or the validity of that act of my country, end of quote. Quote again, there were certain powers and certain rights of a sovereign state which were not yielded by any of the members who signed the United Nations Charter and in particular, this power to recognize the de facto authority of a provisional government was not yielded. When it was exorcised by my government, it was done as a practical step in recognition of realities, the existence of things and the recognition of a change that had actually taken place. I'm certain that no nation on earth has any right to question that or to lay down a proposition that a certain length of time of the exercise of de facto authority must elapse before the, that authority can be recognized, end of quote. Various legal scholars have argued that this rule of individual recognition through the free choice of states should be replaced by collective recognition through an international organization such as the United Nations, example, Lutherpach, recognition in international law. If this were not the rule, then the present impasse would not exist, since there would be no individual recognition of the new Chinese government, but only action by the appropriate United Nations organ. The fact remains, however, that the states have refused to accept any such rule and the United Nations does not possess any authority to recognize either a new state or a new government of an existing state. To establish the rule of collective recognition by the United Nations would require either an amendment of the Charter or a treaty to which all members would adhere. On the other hand, membership of a state in the United Nations and representation of a state in the organs is clearly determined by a collective act of the appropriate organs. In the case of membership by vote of the General Assembly on recommendation of the Security Council, in the case of representation by vote of each competent organ on the credentials of the purported representatives. Since therefore, Recognition of either state or government is an individual act, and either admission to membership or acceptance of representation in the organization are collective acts, it would appear to be legally inadmissible to condition the latter acts by a requirement that they uh, be 
preceded by individual recognition. This conclusion is clearly borne out by the practice in the case of admission to membership of both the League of Nations and in the United Nations. In the practice of the League of Nations, there were a number of cases in which members of the League stated expressly that the admission of another state to membership did not mean that they recognized such new member as a state, for example, Great Britain in the case of Lithuania, Belgium and Switzerland in the case of the Soviet Union, Colombia in the case of Panama. In the practice of the United Nations, there are, of course, several instances of admission to membership of states which had not been recognized by all other states or all other members, I beg your pardon, and other instances of states for whose admission votes were cast by members which had not recognized the candidates as states. For example, Yemen and Burma were admitted by a unanimous vote of the General Assembly at a time they had been recognized by only a minority of members. A number of the members who in the Security Council voted for the admission of Transjordan, that is Jordan, Nepal, had not recognized these candidates as states. Indeed, the declaration made by the delegation of the Soviet Union and its neighbors that they would not vote for the admission of certain states, for example, Ireland, Portugal, and Transjordan, Jordan in brackets, because they were not in diplomatic relations with the applicants, were vigorously disputed by most other members and led to the request for an advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice by the General Assembly. The court was requested to answer the question whether a member in its vote on the admission to membership of another state was, quote, judicially entitled to make its consent to the admission dependent on conditions not expressly provided, end of quote, by paragraph one of article four of the charter. One of the conditions had been stated by members had been the lack of diplomatic relations with the applicant state. The court answered the question in the negative. At its fourth session, the General Assembly recommended that each member act in accordance with the opinion of the court. The practice as regards representation of member states in the United uh, Nations organs has, until the Chinese question arose, been uniformly to the effect that Representation is distinctly separate from the issue of recognition of a government. It is remarkable that, it is remarkable fact that despite the fairly large number of revolutionary changes, revolutionary changes of government, and the larger number of instances of breach of diplomatic relations among members, there was not one single instance of a challenge of credentials of a representative in the many thousands of meetings which were held during four years. On the contrary, whenever the reports of credentials committee were voted on, in brackets, as in the sessions of the General Assembly, they were always adopted unanimously and without reservation by any members. The members have uh, therefore made clear by an unbroken practice that one, a member could properly uh, vote to accept a representative of a government which he did not recognize or with which it had no diplomatic relations. And two, that such a vote did not imply recognition or a readiness to assume diplomatic relations. In two instances involving non-members, the question was explicitly raised the cases of granting the Republic of Indonesia and Israel the right to participate in the deliberations of the Security Council. In both cases, objections were raised on the grounds that these entities were not states. In both cases, the Security Council voted to permit 
representation after explicit statements were made by members of the council that the vote did not imply recognition of the state or government concerned. The practice which has been thus followed in the United Nations is not only legally correct, but conforms to the basic character of the organization. The United Nations is not an association limited to like-minded states and governments of similar ideological persuasion, in brackets, as in the case in certain regional associations. In an organization which aspires to universally, it must be necess uh, must of necessity include states of varying and even conflicting ideologies. The Chinese case is unique in the history of the United Nations, not because it involves a revolutionary change of government, but because it is the first in which two rival governments exist. It is quite possible that such a situation occurs again in the future, and it is highly desirable to see what principle can follow in choosing between the rivals. It has been demonstrated that the principle, principle of numerical uh, preponderance of recognition is inappropriate and legally incorrect. Is any other principle possible? It is submitted that the proper principle uh, can be derived uh, by analogy that Article 4 of the Charter, um, actually, I'll read this again. It is submitted that the proper principle can be derived by analogy from Article 4 of the Charter. This article requires that an applicant for membership must be able and willing to carry out the obligations of membership. The obligations of membership can be carried out only by governments, which in fact possess the power to do so. Where a revolutionary government presents itself representing a state, a rivalry of an existing government, the question at is should be which of these two governments in fact is in a position to employ the resources and direct the people of, of that state in fulfillment of the obligations of membership. In essence, this means an inquiry as to whether the new government exercises effective authority within the territory of the state and is habitually obeyed by the bulk of the population. If so, it would seem to be appropriate for the United Nations organs through collective action to accord it the right to represent the state in the organization, even though individual members of the organization refuse and may continue to refuse to accord it recognition as the lawful government for reasons which are valid under their national policies. And so we end this uh, particular appendix where I can uh, see there are a number of um, links and references to pages and books that Professor Igor Yanev has um, quoted here. And so we end page 316 of Appendix uh, 11. Next um, recording, which will be done shortly, uh, will be on Appendix 12, where we are going to look at the framework agreement concluded at Ohrid, Macedonia, signed in Skopje, Macedonia, on the 13th of August, 2001. A very, very important document that I urge you to please um, uh, do follow Appendix 12 when I am able to uh, present and record for you. For the time being, I thank you for your undivided attention to this uh, incredible piece of uh, work which Professor Igor Yanev has produced containing facts, the truths, documents, real documents, where we learn certain things and where we are in a position to question things because nothing is concrete, is it? <laughs> nothing is in concrete, sealed in concrete. It can always be amended, corrected, you know, 
to suit uh, whatever country is unhappy with whatever arrangements are in existence. Yeah, I think I know you understand what I'm talking about here. So you've been listening to In Focus with me, Silvana Pavlovska, broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia. And we've been looking at uh, uh, Professor Dr. Igor Yanev's publication, the title of which is The Prespa Agreement as Cultural Genocide of the Macedonian National Identity, towards the termination of an illegal treaty. So yes, the Prespa Agreement, a cultural genocide of the Macedonian National Identity, which Professor has proven to, to, to us, through his research, but he's also hopeful because he's saying two words, the termination of an illegal treaty. There is hope there. This publication came out late uh, 2023, so only a few months ago, and I'm very delighted to be able to present this to you um, wherever you are in this world who um, uh, is competent in the English language because this document was produced in English after all. And um, Thanks to Professor Dr. Igor Yanev for giving me the permission to put this uh, in the public domain for you. <music> Appendix 12, a very important appendix because it is the framework agreement. It's titled, concluded in Ohrid, Macedonia, signed in Skopje, Macedonia on the 13th of August 2001. 2001. And here we have the following. Welcome once again. Appendix 12. Framework Agreement, concluded in Ohrid, Macedonia, signed in Skopje, Macedonia, on the 13th of August, 2001. The following points comprise an agreement framework for securing the future of Macedonia's democracy and permitting the development of closer and more integrated relations between the Republic of Macedonia and the Euro-Atlantic community. This framework will promote the peaceful and harmonious development of civil society while respecting the ethnic identity and the interests of all Macedonian citizens. One, basic principles. 1.1, the use of violence in pursuit of political aims is rejected completely and unconditionally. Only peaceful political solutions can assure a stable and democratic future for Macedonia. 1.2. Macedonia's sovereignty and territorial integrity and the unitary character of the state are inviolable and must be, must be preserved. There are no territorial solutions to ethnic issues. 1.3. The multi-ethnic character of Macedonia's society must be preserved and reflected in public life. 1.4. A modern democratic state in its natural course of development and new maturation must continually ensure that its constitution fully meets the needs of all its citizens and comports, comports or conforms, maybe there's an error, typing error, conforms with the highest international standards which themselves continue to evolve. 1.5. The development of local self-government is essential for encouraging the participation uh, of uh, citizens in democratic life and for promoting respect for the identity of communities. Two, cessation of hostilities. 2.1, the parties underline the importance of the commitments of July the 5th, 2001, there shall be a complete cessation of hostilities, complete voluntary disarmament of the ethnic Albanian armed groups and their complete voluntary disbandment. They acknowledge that a decision by NATO to assist in this context will require the establishment of a general, unconditional and open-ended ceasefire 
agreement on a political solution to the problems of this country, a clear commitment by the armed groups to voluntary disarm, and acceptance by all the parties of the conditions and limitations under which the NATO forces will operate. Mm. NATO to assist or do the opposite. Number three, development of decentralized government. 3.1, a revised law on local self-government will be adopted that reinforces the powers of elected local officials and enlarges substantially their comp competencies in conformity with the constitution as amended in accordance with Annex A and the European Charter of Local Self-Government and reflecting the principle of subsidiary in effect of the European Union. Enhanced competencies will relate principally to the areas of public services, urban and rural planning, environmental protection, local economic development, culture, local finances, education, social welfare, and healthcare. A law on financing of local self-government will be adopted to ensure an adequate system of financing, of financing to enable local governments to fulfill all of their responsibilities. 3.2, boundaries of municipalities will be revised within one year of the completion of a new census, which will be conducted under international supervision by the end of 2001. The revision of the municipal boundaries will be effectuated by the local and national authorities with international participation. Participation, mm -hmm. not observation, but participation. 3.3, in order to ensure that police are aware of and responsible to the needs and interests of the local population, local heads of police will be selected by municipal councils from lists of candidates proposed by the Ministry of Interior and will communicate regularly with the councils. The Ministry of Interior will retain the authority to remove local heads of police in accordance with the law. Number four, non-discrimination and equitable representation. 4.1, the principle of non-discrimination and equal treatment of all under the law will be respected completely. This principle will be applied in particular with respect to employment in public administration and public enterprises and access to public financing for business development. 4.2, Laws regulating employment in public administration will include measures to assure equitable representation of communities in all central and local public bodies and at all levels of employment within such bodies, while respecting the rules concerning competence and integrity that govern public administration. The authorities will take action to correct present imbalances in the composition of the public administration, in particular through the recruitment of members of underrepresented communities. Particular attention will be given to ensuring as rapidly as possible that the police services will generally reflect the composition and distribution of the population of Macedonia as specified in Annex C. 4.3, for the Constitutional Court, one third of the judges will be chosen by the Assembly by a majority of the total number of representatives that includes a majority of the total number of representatives claiming to belong to the communities not in the majority in the population of Macedonia. I think we know who they are referring to there, don't you? The, this procedure also will apply to the election of the Ombudsman, public attorney, and the election of three of the members of the Judicial Council. Number five, special parliamentary procedures, 5.1. On the central level, certain constitutional amendments in accordance with Annex A and the law on local self-government cannot be approved without a qualified majority of two thirds of votes within which there may must be a majority of the votes of representatives claiming to belong to the communities, not in the majority in the population of Macedonia. 5.2, laws that directly affect the culture, use of language, education, personal documentation, and use of symbols, as well as laws on local finances, local elections, the city of Skopje and boundaries of municipalities must receive a majority of votes, 
within which there must be a majority of the votes of the representatives claiming to belong to the communities not in the majority in the population of Macedonia. Six, education and use of languages. 6.1, with respect to primary and secondary education, instruction will be provided in the students' native languages, while at the same time, uniform standards for academic programs will be applied throughout Macedonia. 6.2, state funding will be provided for university level education in languages spoken by at least 20% of the population of Macedonia on the basis of specific agreements. Now, Silvana commenting here, where did they get that 20% figure from? At least 20%. Hmm? Where did they get that from? Which hat did it come out of? 6.3, the principle of positive discrimination will be applied in the environment, in the enrollment, I beg your pardon, in state universities of candidates belonging to communities not in the uh, majority in the population of Macedonia until the enrollment reflects equitably the composition of the population of Macedonia. 6.4, the official language throughout Macedonia and in the international relations of Macedonia is the Macedonian language. 6.5, any other language spoken by at least 20%, here we go again, 20%, where does this figure come from? What's the evidence? 6.5, any other language spoken by at least 20% of the population is also an official language. Wow. Okay, so this is a very important clause. This is the one which gave those who allegedly claim 20%, they are form part of 20% uh, of the population, namely the Albanian people uh, who only regard themselves as Albanian, not Macedonian, not even North Macedonian. Mm -hmm. 6.5, any other language spoken by at least 20% of the population is also an official language. Very interesting, because in Australia, we've got many languages spoken. In fact, there are 250 different languages spoken from, from many countries around the world, not to mention the 250 Aboriginal languages that are spoken in Australia as well. So about 500 languages in total. Many of these languages are spoken by communities whose populations are pretty high in Australia, according to the census. Does that mean the Italian language, for example, or um, Arabic language or Mandarin language should also become official languages in Australia? Well, how would you, how would you receive that? Would you accept that as um, Mandarin being the official language of Australia in addition to English? something to ponder over. So once again, going back to 6.5, any other language spoken by at least 20% of the population is also an official language as set forth here in. In the organs of the Republic of Macedonia, any official language other than Macedonia may be used in accordance with the law as further elaborated in Annex B. We will be looking at Annex B and in X, uh, A as well, any person living in a unit of local government in which at least 20% of the population speaks an official language other than Macedonian may use any official language to communicate with the regional office of the central government with responsibility for that municipality, such an office will reply in that language in addition to Macedonian. Yeah. Wonderful, lots of uh, work for interpreters or those who claim to speak Macedonian uh, of Albanian background or those who are maybe Macedonian may know the Albanian language, I don't know, because nationality doesn't come into it, does it? If you're an interpreter, it's a matter of whether you're qualified uh, and doesn't matter what your ethnic background is. Um, at least that is the way here in Australia. So we have the... Um, opening up of, you know, situation whereby uh, people can speak uh, other languages, namely Albanian, because it's uh, now the official language, uh, not just a Macedonian language, even though Albanian is uh, belongs to the Albanian uh, people who are from Albania, <laughs> not, not from, 
from uh, any other place. Uh, however, they find themselves in Macedonia and they've got an official language. Beggars believe. Just think about that, whether that can be applied in Australia. Hmm? What shall we do about that? Uh, so the office has to reply in the language of that person who claims to speak another language and interpreters need to be provided. Mm -hmm. Any person may use any official language to communicate with a main office of the central government, which will reply in that language in addition to Macedonia. I mean, this is a really unbelievable, isn't it? This is in this document that I'm reading to you from Professor Dr. Igor Yanev. This is the framework agreement. Who is the author of this agreement? The framework agreement. Framework agreement. <music> Continuing on, 6.6. .6. With respect to local self-government in municipalities where our community comprises at least 20% of the population of the municipality, again, we've got this 20% figure, 20% figure. Uh, I'd like to know where it comes from. What's the basis for it? What's the evidence? What's the da data? What's the statistics? Uh, and are they true and accurate? The language of that community will be used as an official language in addition to Macedonian. With respect to languages spoken by less than 20% of the population of the municipality, the local authorities will decide uh, democratically on their use in public bodies, public institutions. 6.7, in criminal and civil judicial proceedings at any level, an accused person or any party will have the right to translation uh, at state expense. So the state has to pay <laughs> for services. Yep. In other words, the, the people who pay taxes that goes to the state the, is used to pay for translation services of all proceedings as well as documents in accordance with relevant Council of Europe documents. Now, let's just stop for a moment and ponder over this. So if you have a case before the courts and you uh, uh, are not uh, of Macedonian ethnic background, nor do you well, you claim you don't speak the official language, which is the Macedonian language. Now you are able to use a language where allegedly 20% of the population speaks. Uh, and here, undoubtedly, it's references to um, impl the impl implication is the Albanian language that they can have their documents translated if they claim they don't understand when they probably do understand. Nevertheless, this document, this framework gives them the right to get their documents translated at the expense of the taxpayer. And any other documents in accordance with whatever relevant Council of Europe documents uh, are involved. 6.8, any official personal documents of citizens speaking an official language other than Macedonian will also be issued in that language in addition to the Macedonian language in accordance with the law. Seven, expression of identity. Let's continue, 7.1. 7 7.1. With respect to emblems, here we go. With respect to emblems, next to the emblem of the Republic of Macedonia, local authorities will be free to place on front of their local public buildings, emblems marking the identity of the community in the majority in the municipality, respecting international rules and usages. I wonder what those international rules and usages are. <laughs> I mean, public institutions and buildings. Imagine in Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, wherever in Australia, you've got emblems of other other countries showing, being displayed, yeah? Let's say of the Italian community, if they argue that they have a 20% presence in this country, how would that look to you? Is that something that is feasible? Eight, implementation, 8.1, implementation, okay? Listening carefully, I implementation, 8.1. The constitutional amendments attached at Annex A will be presented to the Assembly immediately. The parties will take all measures to assure, assure adoption of these amendments within 45 days of signature of this framework agreement. 
45 days, another figure here. 8.2, the legislative modifications identified in Annex B will be adopted in accordance with the timetable specified therein. 8.3, the parties invite the international community to convene at the earliest possible time a meeting of international donors that would address in particular macro financial assistance, support for the financing of measures to be undertaken for the purposes of uh, implementing this framework agreement, including measures to strengthen lo local self-government and rehabilitation and reconstruction in areas affected by the fighting. Fighting, you mean the war, the war against the Macedonian people perpetrated by Albanian uh, ultra-nationalistic and criminal uh, networks. Nine, so they're not even using accurate and true terminology here. Nine, annexes. The following annexes constitute integral parts of this framework agreement. There's A, B, C, and A refers to constitutional amendments, B to legislative modifications, C implementation and confidence building measures. Obviously, whoever is the author of this document um, took a lot of time, is of legal background, political, um, um, no doubt, um, partialities and subjectivities, uh, however, will continue, uh, and it is written in English. The document was produced in English. Hmm. So the annexes, A, constitutional amendments, B, legislative modifications, C, implementation and confidence building measures. Now, before I continue, I do want to stress that this is a framework, framework agreement, okay? Framework agreement for those of you who have got, got a legal background, Perhaps you'll be willing to provide some explanation of what this is means. What does it mean? Is it law? Is it a statute? Is it an act? Where does it come from? It's been implemented, but is it is it true? Is it um, based on facts, statistics? Hmm, I'd like to know. Number 10, provisions. This agreement takes effect upon signature. Excuse me. Right. Making sure we are on the right page uh, on my screen as well as on my printed copy. So final provisions, 10.1. This agreement takes effect upon signature. 10.2, the English language version of this agreement is the only authentic version. I just said it a few minutes ago. It is the original version. This document, this framework agreement, so-called, was written in the English language. Definitely not written by a Macedonian-speaking person. <laughs> and I doubt that the Macedonian-speaking people involved in whatever capacity have anything to say about this. It's been written by somebody deliberately in the way that it's been written. So 10.3. The agreement was concluded under the auspices of President Boris Trykovsky. Mm. So Boris Trykovsky was the president of Macedonia, of the Republic of Macedonia at the time, and it was performed in Skopje, Macedonia on the 13th of August, 2001, in the English language. Boris Trykovsky, president of the Republic of Macedonia, Ljubčo Georgievsky, Arben Jaferi. That's a familiar name. Arben Jaferi, president of Vemero Depemene, is Ljubčo, or was Ljubčo Georgievski. And Arben Jaferi, that's a not a Macedonian name, president of the Democratic Party of Albanians. Imagine a Democratic Party of Italians, or Democratic Party of, Ita of uh, Greeks, or Democratic Party of Chinese in Australia, or even of Britain. <laughs> Great Britain or the United Kingdom or United States of America. Branko Cervenkovsky, president of the Social Democratic Union of Macedonia. Imer uh, Imeri, president of the Party for Democratic Prosperity. Again, that Imeri Imeri doesn't sound Macedonian to me, looking at the name itself. 
witnessed by, I may be wrong, you can correct me, and it was witnessed by Francois Leotard, James W. Perdue. Do you remember that fellow, James W. Perdue or Perdue? This first one, Francois Leotard, was the special representative of the European Union. A Frenchman, no doubt. Based on my knowledge of French, limited knowledge of French, nevertheless. James W. Pedro was a special representative of the United States of America. There we have it. That was Appendix 12. The last appendix contained in this scholarly publication by Professor Dr. Igor Yanev. Uh, the title of this scholarly document is The Prespa Agreement as Cultural Genocide of the Macedonian National Identity Towards the Termination of an Illegal Treaty at 2023 Publication. Next time I see you on In Focus with Silvana Pavlovska, we will be uh, delivering to you Annex A and most likely Annex B, providing there is time to do so, that it's not too long uh, for you to listen to and concentrate upon. And um, with that, we will end the uh, uh, this scholarly publication, but I'll tell you more, more about it, of course, next time I see you. So this has been a program titled In Focus with Silvana Pavlovska, an independent journalist broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia. And I thank you for your attention, undivided attention. Please do go back and listen to episodes you haven't heard. Um, you might have missed certain things. I certainly will be going through the document again. And so looking forward to seeing you very soon. Thanks once again.